Hi, this is Jeremy with the Ark Encounter. Uh, we are here today to give you a tour of the Ark Encounter exhibits and to give a little explanation, the reasoning behind them. And I have Tim Chafee here with me. He is, he is the content manager of the attractions division. So when it comes to Creation Museum, when it comes to the Ark Encounter exhibits, he's the man to go to for the content for them. And he's going to be explaining the exhibits today and just giving a little more insight to what you, you're going to see and the reasoning, the content behind it. And also, um, we'll be getting just a sneak peek of some of the exhibits. And uh, I'll hand it over to Tim, and let's go ahead and take, take a look. All right, good morning. Let's take a tour. We're in the very beginning of the arc after you've gone through the queue line. And then you, step up, you come up our, our beautiful ramp, which we've kind of skipped that process this morning for the sake of time. But then you enter into the ark in what we call the first floor show. And you can see all sorts of animal cages built here. And uh, the purpose is just, uh, you, if you can hear the soundtrack, you can hear the wind and the waves, not the waves, but the wind picking up. The storm is just getting started. So the, the first floor of the ark is designed to show life at the very beginning of the flood. So as the family gathered together and the flood gets started, uh, what, it, what is it like for them? And that's what we're going to see in just a little bit. But you can see the design in these cages, and it's a little bit loud back here, but um, each of these cages has a, a food area, a food chute, and then also a watering trough, so it's very easy for the family members to take care of all of these animals uh, quickly. And each of them have slotted floors underneath here, and then a ramp, so if the animal went, when the animal uses the bathroom, if we can say it that way, it would drop down to the ramp and drop all the way down to the bottom and the people only have to clean out the little trough at the very bottom for all of these racks. So you don't have to open up each individual cage and clean them out. Of course our animals don't do that but it's the purpose was to show how Noah and his family could have cared for roughly 7,000 animals in a, in a quick fashion. This gives people the, some idea of how large these timbers are. When we talk about the largest timber frame structure in the world, that's what we're talking about, the certain type of construction that was used here uh, with, these, with these massive timbers. Uh, and we still have sap coming down, so if you're visiting, don't put your fingers on there or you're gonna get sticky. <laughs> but we've got hundreds of animal cages here, uh, different sizes and storage containers on the wall. In a sense, this area serves as like a another queue line as well. So if it's a very busy day, people will get to walk through here and they'll be out of the elements from down below. You know, if it's a cold day or something, at least they're up in, inside the ark. But people always wonder, how could you fit all the animals in the ark? And we're showing right from the very beginning the just how much space there was for cages. Um, whenever they t ask that question, they always think of the biggest animals. You know, we always think of elephants and giraffes and rhinos. But almost every animal, when you think about it, is much, much smaller. The reptiles, the amphibians, the even the mammals, they're most, most of them are a lot smaller and would fit in cages like the size we've already seen. And then as we get near the end of the first floor show, we get to meet Noah's family. Uh, the, the goal is to have each family member appear on the ark once per floor. So you'll get to meet them three times. And in this scene, we're going to see them praying as the flood is just getting started. Uh, you know, we don't know exactly what they did at the start of the flood, but it makes sense that Noah, being a righteous man, would be, uh, would be praying to God at this point. So we get to see each family member here. And Noah is an animatronic but we don't hear any words in this scene. We just get to see the family members. And we have uh, some people coming all the way from Florida today, and or on their way from Florida. And we also have another couple coming from coming today as well. So uh, people are watching this that are here. We're glad you're coming and uh, looking forward to it. We're open from 9 a.m. to midnight. It's great to see it during the day, but it's also fascinating to see it at night when you have the sunset behind the ark. So you can stay here all day, and you, there's a lot to do just looking at the exhibits and also the Ararat Red Zoo. So uh, glad you guys are coming. And if you were here last night, you could have seen a rainbow right over the top of the ark seven days after opening, so that was pretty special. And if, if they want, people who are watching now can send in their questions on Facebook as well. And 
we'll do our best to address those. Uh, these pots right here that people see, these are a design for how the uh, reptiles and amphibians could have been kept. It's pretty. It's an ingenious system because these cloth coverings, you could just pour water through the top of that to keep them moist, and then there's little corks on the bottom of each one that you could pull out and drain the, the waste and the, the fluid that's in there, and it would run all the way down the trough down to the bottom, and you just collect it at the, at the very end. So it's a, a very quick way to uh, care for the reptiles and the amphibians. In this wide open area on the first floor, our goal was to introduce people to the concept of animal kinds, because when people think about the animals on the ark, they think, well, how could, how could Noah fit you know, millions of species? We hear that number thrown out there a lot. But he didn't have to worry about millions of species. He only had to worry about the land-dependent animals. And when we're talking about, um, when, when they throw out the number of millions of species, when they say 5 million, 10 million, what they're not telling you is they're including the microorganisms, they're including all the marine creatures, they're including the, um, the insects, which Noah probably didn't have to bring. So we wanted to deal with that right from the very beginning. And we have signage throughout this area that talk about certain things, like you know, how did Noah keep the polar bears cool? Well, there weren't polar bears on the ark because polar bears are just part of the bear kind. And so he just needed two bears. And we have a question. Uh, are the bottles behind you for lamp oil you know, when we were back there? Uh, we have several different types of, of uh, containers, like amphoras. Uh, some of them would be for water. Some of them would be for grain. Some of them would be for, for oil, for the oil lamps. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're, they're shown as storage. We don't necessarily show what each one of them are for. But like this one right here, this large one, this would be a watering trough for both of these cages. Here we've got the bear kind and we've got the sloth kind. And it goes to both cages so they could one container could feed could water both groups of animals and then we also have another question regarding lodging if you go to arkencounter.com and click on places to stay you can find uh, plenty of places to lodge there we and we have uh, our exclusive provider that we work with called dat travel if you click on their website from arkencounter.com you can find everything you need in regards to lodging so I mentioned that we wanted to deal with a lot of the questions about the, the, the number of animals, and when people think of the animals, they think of the largest ones they can. But we have a sign that deals with that right from the beginning. You know, even with the largest ones, it makes a lot more sense that Noah would bring the juveniles or smaller varieties within that kind. Uh, juveniles, they, they take up less space, they eat less, they are more durable, they create less waste, and they have many more years after the flood to reproduce, which is the point in bringing them in the first place. So even if you know, when Noah's bringing the elephants, it doesn't have to be the one that is, you know, 12 feet or 13 feet tall at the shoulders. He can bring a, a smaller variety within the elephant kind, uh, like a paleomastodon or a, a juvenile elephant, and they take up a lot less space. So you mean the giraffe's not going to have his neck sticking out of the window? That's exactly right. The giraffe would not... Well, I think you can see there's plenty of room, and we're on the first floor, which is actually the, has the lowest ceiling clearance. But this, we wanted to do this as well because the skeptics oftentimes will say, well, where did he put the whales, or where did he put all these fish? Um... There was a pretty big lake outside of the ark during the flood. In fact, the whole world was a flood, so he didn't have to bring the marine creatures. And when we remove that from the equation, when we remove all the plant species, all the marine creatures, all the insects, and all the microorganisms, that number of species, when they're talking in the millions, drops down to 34,000. But then we're not talking about the species of animals. We're talking about the kinds of animals. Uh, for example, the coyotes and the the dingoes and the wolves, those are all different species, but they're just two dogs. So he only needed two of the dog kind. But we wanted to remind people that there's also extinct animals, or animals that are now extinct, that would have been on board the ark. So uh, with this sign over here, we actually deal with the question about whether or not 99% of all species have gone extinct. And we won't deal with everything here, but that's all based on evolutionary assumptions that life has been evolving for billions of years. In terms of the number of animals that have actually been the fossils that have actually been discovered of animals that are extinct, it's only in the thousands, not the millions or the billions. Um, we have someone that's going to be coming back, and actually there are a couple new things that you might see, even since opening. A uh, very dynamic team here, and we, ha we have them continuing to update things, install things, upgrade things as we're going on. So we'll, we might show you a couple new things here today as well. Yeah, that sounds great. I, we, we just saw some upstairs. We'll see as we head up there, which we're going to go toward the second floor now, uh, we'll see a few of the newer uh, things that have been installed. 
and we still have plans for plenty more that are going to be going in. So in this, I mentioned before in this area we want to deal with the animal kinds, so we've already dealt with some of that, but um, there's other issues that as we go along, how did you, you know, how did Noah know the difference between the clean and the unclean? Well, if you think about it, he really didn't have to know the difference because God's the one that brought the animals to him. So if he only brought a pair of a certain animal, that's an unclean one. If he brought uh, seven or seven pairs, then it's a clean animal or a flying creature, and he had to bring them. And we wanted to, as as best as we can, try to figure out exactly how many animals there were. But anytime it was a, there was an unknown factor, we err on the side of going too high. And so we wanted to talk about that in the bat exhibit, which is right here. There are 18 different families of bats in the world today that are alive, and four or five extinct families of bats. It's very possible they all come from the same kind, that there's just one kind. But because we don't have all the data for that, we've separated them out. And since they're flying creatures, we're bringing seven pairs of each of them. So what really might have been just seven bats on the ark, we're showing as over 300. Wow. So when we talk about the number of kinds or the number of animals on the ark, we are probably overestimating. And uh, we have, our count shows fewer than 7,000. So viewers can get a, a glimpse of the, the beautiful ramp that we have here as you walk, uh, that we're going to be taking to get up to the second floor. And at the end of this first floor, we have uh, what we call the half arc model, because our arc, the ark encounter, is not laid out the way that we think that Noah would have laid it out, um, for obvious reasons. You know, we have to have thousands of guests coming through every single day. Noah didn't have thousands of guests; there were just eight people. Um, so his was loaded up with with the animals and all the storage. We have offices. We have, um, you know audio video control rooms we have all sorts of things to make the experience uh, memorable so what we did was we created a half arc model and we wanted to show people what we how we think the arc the real arc would have been laid out well, I shouldn't say the real arc ours is the real arc too but Noah's arc might have been laid out and so you can see all of the various systems designed in here you can see where all of the animals would have been kept you, uh, the, the storage and the, the food and you can even see some of the things we just looked at you know, down here is some of the pots for amphibians. And we've actually gone through and counted the number of animals that need to be on, and we've ac accounted for all of those in this half arc model. So was there plenty of room on the arc, even like empty space, even with all the animals and the food and all that? Or, I mean, was there even plenty of room for other people to come on board, if, if that were to be the case? It, it's actually uh, interesting that with the number of animals we have and the amount of space, the everything fits quite well actually there's not a whole lot of extra space there's not um, it it's not that it's overloaded it fits just right which if you think about it, it makes sense God would tell Noah how big to build the ark because God knows how many people are going he knows how many animals there will be how much food they need uh, you know there's some things the Bible doesn't specifically tell us we don't know if Noah knew how long they were going to be on the ark you know does nowhere in the Bible doesn't say Noah you're gonna be on the ark for about a year so bring this much food it seems like he, whatever room he had left over, they would just pack with food, and it turns out that it was enough. So there was a question related to that. How much vegetation that they would need while being on board the ark? Because um, they didn't need meat because they're all vegetarian at that point, and, um, you know, would the vegetation go bad? I mean, what about that? Yeah, would the vegetation go bad? We'll see on the third floor as we get up there that we actually show a garden that um, some plants that don't require a whole lot of light, maybe they could have grown on the top floor. Uh, because you had the opening on the on the top of the ark, so there's a possibility they could grow some plants there. Uh, there are some vegetables that keep really well. Um, what do you call them? Like root vegetables, uh, things like garlic and onions and potatoes. They can keep for a while, but um, a lot of the food for the animals, I think, would have been in grains or seeds, uh, things like of that nature that would keep. But they could preserve uh, they could preserve foods in other ways, drying them. Uh, I guess pickling them, although animals I don't think really would like that very often, very much. But there are a lot of ways to preserve the foods, but uh, we think a lot of it would have been uh, some sort of grain or grass that would have been kept. So now we're heading up the ramp to the second floor. And you can see as from the ramp, especially as we're going to go onto the next floor when we go between the second and third, you can see some of the, the beauty of this structure. Uh, it really is just an incredible uh, facility 
with, even without the exhibits, just the arc itself is, is spectacular. Now we're heading up to the second floor. So we have a question. How many hours does it take to tour the Ark? Uh, how many hours does it take to tour the Ark? It really depends on how much of the content you want to read, how many of the things you want to uh, stop and consider. Uh, if you were to... Uh, if you were to take in every single exhibit, watch the various videos, read the signage, it's going to take you a full day to do it. And we're open for the, you know, until August 15th, I believe it is. We're open from 9 till midnight. Yes. So you have plenty of time if you come during that time. If you're somebody who likes to, you know, skip through exhibits pretty quickly, you know, there are some people that do that. They just kind of like to see it and move along. Uh, it, would take, it still would take you a few hours to go through everything. And then don't forget the Ararat Ridge Zoo that we have here, seeing all the animals there. Or Mzara's Kitchen, which is the, the restaurant, 1,500 seat restaurant that we have that is um, full of beautiful taxidermy mounts. A lot of African animals, uh, wildebeest, leopard, uh, several different kinds of antelope, uh, really spectacular taxidermy work that's in there. For sure. Oh, and speaking of which, if you want to come back, we'll be doing a, a live stream from the Ararat Ridge Zoo, you know, shortly after 10 o'clock or, or whenever we get done here. All right, we're coming up to the Pre-Flood World exhibit which is one of my favorite, partly because of the artwork, um, partly because of the subject matter. What we wanted to do is take guests on a tour from, from creation, when the world was perfect, through this fallen world up until the time of the flood. And so we get to see the world breaking, in a sense. You know, at the beginning, God created everything, and, it, and he says it was very good. So on the left side here, we have the, the days of creation, what he made on each of the days. And on the top, it reminds us that it was very good. And then you've got day seven where God rested. We see that originally mankind, both male and female, were created perfect, uh, without sin. And at that time, uh, marriage was, that first marriage was originally perfect as well. So we, in this room, this, this area, we wanted to show a glimpse of what that perfect world may have been like. But then we know what happened next. And we know that Eve was tempted and she ate the fruit. And we know that uh, Adam ate the fruit as well. So as we move into the next area, things get a little bit darker and we see the world breaking. But the artwork in this room is, is really quite spectacular throughout. And this is one of our larger exhibits. Uh, it takes up uh, almost four bays, plus we extend that out into the hallway. So it's, um, I think it's our third largest exhibit in that, in that sense. And then we also have uh, the Garden of Eden exhibit at the Creation Museum, too, that kind of very much complements this, don't you think? Yeah, it really does. The Garden of Eden at the Creation Museum is... It's, in fact, some of the things that you see there, like the serpent, we designed our serpent based on that. Um, and then when we get into this room, we call this Descent into Darkness. So we're going to see the world get worse and worse. And we have a, a sign talking about how man often abuses what God has given. And uh, so certain things that we find in Genesis 4 through 6, um, that, that it talks about, you know, Cain building a city. Well, building a city in and of itself isn't necessarily bad. But when you have a wicked civilization and and you have a sinful heart, then that can be used for evil. And the same thing with metalworking. The Bible talks about Tubal Cain being an instructor of bronze and iron. Um, that in and of itself is not bad. But again, in a wicked society, those things can be used for evil. And the same thing is true with music. So this wall showcases that, shows how the world is getting worse and worse. We see a reverse of what we saw earlier with the perfect marriage and perfect humanity. Now it's all corrupted. And we see in this area mankind abusing God's creation. Now, we do talk about uh, the artistic license that we're taking in this area because the Bible doesn't give us every description of what, you know, what's going on in Genesis 6 before the flood. It tells us about the wickedness of man. Uh, it tells us that man was exceedingly violent. It tells us uh, certain things that go on, but we had to use um, artistic license to, to portray specific instances of that. But we're upfront about that too. Uh, on opening day, a little over a week ago, I had the opportunity to uh, guide 21. Working was well. Aren't you just making some of this up? And I said, Well, we're upfront about that. We're saying here's artistic license. Uh, we gave names to the wives of, you know, to Noah's wife and to the wives of the sons. The Bible doesn't name them. 
well, why do we do that? Well, part of it, it personalizes them. And if you always said, well, Shem's wife or Ham's wife, or J and you say that throughout, then it, it becomes a little dull. So we wanted to give them some personality, and we named them, but we're upfront about that. We say, yes, this is artistic license. And they said, well, it's like a museum. You shouldn't be making things up. And I said, well, the museums make things up all the time. And they said, no, they don't. And I said, what about Lucy's feet? You know, the Australopithecine, they always give Lucy human feet, yet no foot bones were found of Lucy. So that's just their imagination. And they're not, they don't, they're not honest about that. They don't, they, they don't say that they're taking artistic license. So by the time we're done with pre-flood world, we see the, the flood coming and judgment falling on that world, which is a reminder of the coming judgment as well. Because Jesus compared the, the days of Noah to the days of his return. So now, and of course, the flood would have changed everything too, which is why we have to use artistic license because we don't have a whole lot of evidence back then of what it might have looked like. Yeah, that's a great point. We don't have um, record of their civilization anymore because it's been wiped out by the flood. So now we get to the second floor. Uh, a lot of the area on the second floor is designed to show what life was like during the midst of the flood. How did the family care for the animals? What did some of the animals look like? And we've actually... Our approach to that was to look at, um, or to design about 50-50. About 50% 50, 50 of the animals we've made are now extinct, and 50% are ones that still have living representatives. But even the ones that have living representatives, as we'll see, look a little bit different. Um, this one, I think, will surprise some people what this is. Uh, a lot of people haven't recognized it, but this is Pachycetus, which is a, a, a mammal that seems like it dwelled uh, close to the water. Uh, sort, of, sort of like an otter, but maybe not as aquatic, more terrestrial. But um, it's one that is used by evolutionists oftentimes to talk about um, the evolution of the whale. They say this is an early whale, and I think we can see that that's not the case. So over here is one of my favorite creatures. It's, it, even though it looks a little bit like a saber-toothed cat, it's not. It's a marsupial. So Jeremy, being an Australian, you probably would like the, uh, the marsupial thing. Oh, of course. <laughs> Although these are marsupials that were found in South America. Uh, so this is called Thylaca smilus. And uh, when fully grown, they would be the, about, the size of a <coughs> excuse me, about the size of a jaguar. And these ones are really uh, quite spectacular. And they were considered an apex predator after the flood in South America. So meaning that they were at the top of the food chain where they lived. But they're extinct now, unfortunately. So you think uh, this is one of the very unique locations that you can come and see extinct animals that you might not have ever seen sculpted before? Yeah, as far as we know, there are certain animals that we've created or that we've developed that um, that you can't find as a you know life-size representation anywhere else in the world. Some of them are a little bit strange looking, uh, but they're unique in their own way. In fact, that's uh, something that animatronic Noah will talk about is... Uh, that all of God's creations, all of his creatures, have uh, unique features that that really are designed to help us recognize his creativity, his greatness. So we'll, we'll bypass what's called the, the kids' spooky animal encounter. This is a fun area for kids to walk through, and they can do some uh, fun things. The question is, what did the animals do when Noah's family slept at night? So it's just a, a fun area that takes up two bays. And here we have a really important exhibit, and it's one that is often overlooked, but one of the biggest questions we get, one of the ways that people mock the, the biblical account of the ark and the flood, and the way they mock the Bible in general is they'll always ask, well, did Noah bring unicorns on the ark? Well, Jeremy, take a look. There they are. Those are the ark's unicorns, and people look at that and say, well, they look like rhinoceros. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if you look at the description of what's called a unicorn in the King James Bible and in some of the other older Bibles, every description of that matches the, uni matches the rhinoceros perfectly. And e it even talks about in Deuteronomy that there's a one-horned variety and a two-horned variety of unicorn. And one horn is larger than the other. Well, rhinoceros fits that description perfectly. It talks about how the young will, can skip. It talks about how they're too strong. You wouldn't hook up your plow to it, that you would never put it by your by your child's crib. Every description of that creature matches the rhinoceros perfectly. So uh, here is, here are the unicorns on the ark. That's fascinating. Yeah, so they're not a horse-like animal with one horn like they're often depicted. Sure. Uh, 
Uh, I mentioned earlier that some of the animals that even have that have living representatives would look a little bit different. Well, I think everybody would recognize these as part of the giraffe kind, but they don't look like modern giraffes. They have a much shorter neck. And the reason for that is that they are designed after an extinct uh, species of giraffe known as the Chancetherium. So these are these are animals that we find in the fossil record in layers that we believe were post-flood and up to or during the Ice Age. And we figured those were the types of animals that would best represent what, we, what would have been on the Ark. And so that's how we designed each of the animals that you see on here. So with um, these two giraffes, you would have all the genetic material to get the giraffes that we see today? Yeah, not just the giraffes that we see, the, you know, the real tall, 18 feet tall, you know, bull giraffe, but also like the okapi is part of the giraffe kind as well. Yeah. Uh, so evolutionists and creationists agree on that point, but the timing of how long it took to go from you know, one, you know, for those to split, we disagree. We would say that that information was already present uh, within that kind to to have the okapi and also the giraffe, whereas the evolutionary view would have to say, no, they, they need to gain that information that has to evolve, it has to come from somewhere. So really what we what we show throughout the ark and a lot of, and some of the scientific exhibits is that we have the same world, but we have two different views based on our starting points. And so you'll see throughout the arc this, this teaching point called One World, Two Views to show the evidence and then people can consider does it line up better with what scripture teaches or with what other people have been taught. You know, one of the things that I noticed, it was like been several weeks before I seen the arc and before it opened. I came here, I was just seeing it on the live stream videos like you guys are today. And one thing that I noticed when I came here, it, it was totally different, grander, very unique. You can only get a glimpse of what you're seeing in the live stream is when you actually come. It's very unique and it, it's just amazing. Just the first time that you drive up from the bus to when you get in here and you see all the the wood, the timber frame structure, all the cages, it's, it just brings it to life for you. Yeah, it really does. And it smells great too because of all the wood. So oh, if yeah. you like that smell of cut wood, it's it's really nice. But you can see uh, catwalks up above us and over here. And these are designed to show how the family could have fed these larger animals. So they could go from the storage areas up above us on the mezzanine and bring food and water to the various animals. So we're walking into our animal kinds exhibit. And this is one that there will, uh, we'll see um, added to shortly. But we wanted to deal with that issue of how could you get that number of species, that 34,000 land-dwelling species that we know about today, including extinct and uh, extant, the still living ones, and how could how could you reduce that number down to less to fewer than 1,400 kinds? And so this exhibit is designed to help explain the how the kinds on the ark developed into the species we see today. And it's actually pretty easy to understand as you as you walk through and you look at the issue of dogs. Dogs are a great teaching tool for us uh, because we understand all the various breeds of dogs we see today uh, really just developed in the last 300 or 400 years through selective breeding and we see so much variation within those dogs that it's easy to understand how you can have that information present within the dogs on the ark that would that would um, give rise to such variety we see today and we've got a, a, a video that explains the process that people went through our designers who are incredibly skilled to create the animals that they did and so far, that's been a real hit with people to watch that video. And then I mentioned before, we have this one world, two views idea. And so you'll see this little logo throughout the arc when we're dealing with the two different world views. That is it based on what scripture says, or is it based on man's opinions about the past? And then you can compare which one lines up better with what we see today. These creatures in front of us right now, um, a lot of times people wonder what they are. Sometimes people will say, oh, look at the, the bear. Well, no, we've already seen the bears downstairs. These aren't bears. These are an extinct creature known as Anisodon, and they're, they're quite unique. They're, their front knuckles or front forearms are locked in a certain position, so they're turned inward, and they would, they would have been knuckle walkers. But they're, they're rather large creatures. In fact, these are only about half, uh, half the size of a fully grown adult. And here we can see one of Noah's family members. This is actually Ham's wife. Uh, we've named her Kezia. Uh, here she's feeding uh, one of the animals as well. And back on this side, we have the, the end of what's known as the animal care exhibit. How could they provide 
fresh water and uh, enough fresh air and light and how could they remove the waste and um, how would you feed animals that have picky diets you know like the well Jeremy being from uh, Australia one that comes up a lot is the koala yeah. well the modern koalas eat, eat almost exclusively eucalyptus the leaves of certain eucalyptus trees so did Noah bring a whole bunch of eucalyptus trees on the ark well no he didn't need to now, koalas actually can survive off of some other types of leaves but if we think about what's happened since the flood they have become more and more specialized and if you go back closer to the time of Noah they they would have been able to thrive on other foods as well but they become so specialized over time that they're in a sense they're almost addicted to eucalyptus leaves the next four bays that we have here we call them uh, we call them our working quarters here we have uh, Noah's uh, study and in here we have an animatronic Noah that will answer 13 questions so Jeremy, if you want to pick one there, uh, he's... All right, there's a plenty of questions here. How did you find all of the animals? How were you able to fit all of the animals? How many animals are on the ark? Why are these birds here? How long have you been married, Noah? Um, let's say, how did you find all of the animals? How did I find all the animals? Well, it really wasn't hard to find the animals since God brought them right to me. Just as he said he would. I just wondered when he would send them. We were nearly finished building the ark when hundreds of spectacular animals arrived. <laughs> I should have known. God's timing is perfect. And he always keeps his promises. So speaking of interviewing Noah, don't we have some sort of video presentation before you come into the ark where someone comes and interviews Noah? Yeah, in the queue line there's about a 15 minute video where people can uh, where people can watch Noah being interviewed by a, a tabloid reporter. So, so she's very, Noah kind of fun. So not only is he answering you know questions that people really have about building the ark, but um, how about this, why don't you look like you're 600 years old? Oh yeah. Why don't I look 600? What do you mean? I look about the same age as any other 600-year-old person I've met. Well, except for my wife, of course. She doesn't look a day past 400. <laughs> if you say so, still as beautiful as she was on our wedding day. So we gave Noah a little soft side as well, and he flirts with his wife, who's in the exhibit as well. So that was the Noah study. We also have the uh, library here. <laughs> you know, could Noah read and write? Could he, would he have had things like this? Um, you know, or, or were, were they Stone Age people, prehistoric is what a lot of times people think of. Even, but we think of that, that term prehistoric doesn't make any sense from a biblical perspective, does it, Jeremy? Really, I mean, God created Adam and Eve, fully functioning adult humans with uh, brains. But they're probably smarter than we are today because we have a lot of mutations now because of sin and the curse, don't you think? Oh, I think so. Plus, they lived a lot longer. They could acquire a lot more knowledge during that time. Uh, so it's very plausible that they could read and write uh, at that time. There, there's no reason to think that they couldn't. Uh, but So in, in this room we have a lot of memorabilia that, they that maybe they would have hung on to. Um, but also we see scrolls and uh, we actually see a unique feature that a maybe a lot of people haven't caught on to yet. But if, if you want to look up here, we've developed a language for Noah and his family to use. So throughout the ark in certain exhibits you'll see this, this language written and it, it really does say something. Um, it is based on English. It's, we've done it as a one-to-one -one, uh, cor correlation. But um, if people get the little translation key, they can come through and read what everything says in Noah's language. Uh, there, there's some writing like that in the animal care exhibit. Uh, on some of the signs, we even see it here. Uh, the description of these animals, like the, uh, the thylacosmilus over there. And there's a funny one here. I'll just translate it for you. Uh, this one right here says something like, watch out for his claws. <laughs> so will there be a translation key that people can acquire eventually? Yeah, that's something that we want to make available to people. But the other possibility, and we've been talking with the, um, with, with the team that's been working on the Ark Encounter app, something that is not available yet, but I believe they're still working on, 
uh, what we wanted to be able to do is include um, software in that app that you could actually just scan it with your phone and it would translate it for you. Uh, oh, so we, cool. we've had a demo of that and it, it worked well, but it's just a matter of incorporating that into the, into the app eventually. So that would make it easy, but yeah, you could also give you know, the kids a little card that had the, the code and then they could figure it out. And here we have Noah's uh, workshop. Uh, the idea here is to that at, from time to time certain things might break down while they're on the ark. You know, they, we think they would have built the cages strong and everything, but you still have animals and you have a, a boat that's rocking and, or the ark would be moving on the waves. So how could they repair certain things? We, we show a wood shop here. Uh, obviously we know Noah was skilled at woodworking. And we got a photo op next to uh, to the, the, what we call the blacksmith area uh, because uh, if they're using implements, if they need to make any tools, they could have done that on the Ark. We know at that time uh, people were capable of working with metal. Then we have an exhibit called Who Was Noah? And, the, and How Could He Build the Ark? The idea here is to give a, a backstory for who Noah was, how he acquired the skills that he had to build the Ark. We know that he must have possessed leadership qualities in order to guide the team that was building the Ark. Uh, obviously, woodworking ability, um, shipbuilding possibly, or maybe he hired people to do that. Um, the metalworking we talked about. So, we again, we're upfront about the fact that we're using some artistic license. We even talk about that here. But we use the clues that we find in Scripture to tell a a backstory for who Noah was and uh, what his life was like up until the time that God called him to build the ark. And if I can put in a little shame, so well they this is really good, why don't you write a novel out of it? So we've done that, and Master Books will be publishing that in probably a little over a month. So that's coming up. You can find, that that's called Noah, a Man of Destiny. So doesn't it show that we're more advanced because we have electricity? I mean, back then, they were just Stone Age people. <laughs> yeah, we actually have an exhibit up on the, on the third floor, if we want to hold on to that question. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, the first sign in the Ancient Man exhibit is that technology does not equal intelligence. And so many people think that, is that, oh, the level of technology means that if you have a higher technology, we have smartphones, we're doing this interview through a smartphone or this tour that couldn't have been done just five years ago. That doesn't mean we're smarter than people five years ago, it just means that we've built on the, the technology that they had, and that's, you know, that's been true throughout history. You think of some of the the people that in in our world we think of as some of the smartest people that have lived, Albert Einstein. He didn't have smartphones, but he's smarter than people using them today. Same with Isaac Newton. This exhibit here is called the Fairy Tale Arc. Uh, it's been a favorite for a lot of people, um, and it might look a little bit different than what people would expect to see here because we've, as a ministry, we've often warned people about these cute arcs. So why would we have an exhibit talking about these cute arcs? Well, we wanted to warn people about these things that um, we're not saying that hey if you've ever done this you know how dare you ever do that what we want to do is get the we want people to understand the the dangers that are um, that are related to these things if if you're showing young people a cute fun little arc and you have the giraffe's head sticking out and you have just a couple of animals that can fit on there and they're in a boat that would never float in a sense you're telling young people this is a fairy tale and when you look around our ark, and you can, we can look way down on that end and way down on this end, you can see what the ark really would have been like for the size. And you can understand how could the animals fit on there. But if you, all the pictures you ever see is of these things, then why would you ever think that, this, that the ark account could be real? In fact, during the protest, one of the atheists held up a sign of a little bathtub ark like this and said, um, you know, this boat won't float. Well, we agree with them. It wouldn't <laughs> because that wasn't the ark. The Ark was a, a massive uh, structure. So that's what this exhibit, even though it's fun and it's cute, we wanted to use that to, to help people understand the dangers inherent yeah. with those bathtub arcs. And that's one of the first things I noticed when I came for the first time when it was open is the size of it. it it's a lot bigger than what you would have think. Yeah, that's, uh, I mentioned that I led the tour um, last week with, with over 20 atheists. And when we were coming up the hill on the, on the bus, on the tram road, uh, they were asking me questions, and then I, I stopped them right when we were getting toward the top of the hill. I said, I want you guys to look out to your right so that they could view the ark for the first time up close. And their jaws dropped when they saw it. It was, it was really a, a neat experience to watch that. 
Here's an exhibit that's, that's currently being finished up right now. Uh, this is Japheth's wife, and she's near the door of the ark, uh, which that Noah and his family would have come through, that the animals would have come through. And she's struggling with the fact that everybody outside of the ark has perished. And she would have had family members. She might have had friends that, that weren't on board the ark. And so it's hitting her pretty hard at this point. And we wanted to deal with some of those questions that people have about God's judgment, about God, about his justice, about why is death a punishment for sin. And, of course, we could never get into full detail of those topics. They're very heavy topics. But we wanted to at least scratch the surface of that and give people the right perspective on those things. I tell you what, they're very lifelike with the animatronics and, and the movement and just talking. It's very lifelike. I agree. They're, they're spectacular. Even from the time that we built the Creation Museum and when animatronic Noah went in a little bit later, the one we have here that we just watched is much more lifelike than the one at the Creation Museum. And that just shows how much technology has advanced just in the past uh, past several years. And because the one at the, at the museum is fine, but then this one, people see him and they think, wow, he looks pretty real. I tell you what. And uh, that's actually new. If you would have come in the last week, you wouldn't have seen that. They're continuing to update the exhibits and install new things. So we definitely encourage you to come back. Uh, even if it's you know just a month, I'm sure you know they're continuing to update it and definitely come back next year because I'm sure that again it's going to be dramatically different. All right. Well, Jeremy just mentioned some of the exhibits that are some of the things that we'll be adding to the the one that we just saw with um, Japheth's wife that was currently being finished up. Uh, then we've also seen the animatronic Noah. The, before, he was already working on opening day, but we didn't have all the questions there, so he would just uh, go through, cycle through the questions, so people could still see him moving. But now you can ask the questions in the order that you want to. And when we get to the top of this ramp onto the third floor, uh, we're going to see the place where I think the most important exhibit that we have will be going in. But I want to stop right here and have people look down both uh, sides of the ark here. This is one of my favorite places in the ark just to look at the structure of it. And you can, we're really about in the middle of the ark. So you have more than 200 feet this way and 200 feet in the other direction. And you can see all the way down what we call our, our light shaft. If you look up at the top, we have some of these uh, window skylights that would allow light to funnel down through this all the way down to the first floor. But it's really a spectacular view. You get to see some of the massive timbers that were used. So even if you're somebody who's out there saying, well, I don't, I don't believe what the Bible says about the ark, but if you're somebody who likes architecture, if you're somebody who likes woodworking, this is a must-see. This is one of the most spectacular places that you'll ever find. So now we're heading up to the third floor, and again, if, if we pan around, you can see some of the, uh, the architecture. You can see some of the woodwork. And these large timbers that you see, uh, these were uh, felled from a, a dead standing forest, so it's not like we um, killed a bunch of trees to, to build this. We wanted it to be as um, environmentally friendly as possible. After all, God uh, gave Adam and Eve dominion of the earth, so you know, they need to take care of the earth and not dis destroy it in any way like that. Right, dominion doesn't mean to dominate it, and it, it means that we are to be good stewards of it. And as Christians, we believe that we should be good stewards of our environment. But at the point, at the same time, we don't go to an extreme point where we worship the the environment. Yes, humans humans are made in the image of God and are much more valuable if it's a decision between a human and an animal. Right, and we'll come back and look at this as we wrap things up. This right now is one of my favorite presentations in the ark but now we're on the third floor and we're going to be walking toward what we call the living quarters exhibit uh, this is one of the themed areas where there's not really a whole lot of teaching points you just get to see what life may have been like for the family in their in their living quarters in their rooms and in the, the kitchen dining area and i mentioned the garden earlier we also have an aviary in here And if we look out across to the other side, I don't know if this is... The, it, for some reason, it always reminds me... Um, 
almost of like a mall when you're walking through. <laughs> and this, not the ark itself. The ark doesn't look like a mall, but it's just we have all these different exhibits. And in it, when we're walking through here, and you have that big opening in the middle, it, it almost seems like you know you're I'm going to shop at Flood Legends today or something. But <laughs> <laughs> I see you me. But this is far more spectacular. Hey, maybe somebody will take this design and use that for a mall someday. That's a great idea. <laughs> Should I patent that? <laughs> I'm sure it already is. <laughs> it probably already is. All right, so we're coming up to the living quarters, and we wanted to introduce the family members to uh, guests, so we get to see each of the couples here on this sign. We get to see Noah and his wife, and I mentioned before we made up the names for the women on the ark, so we named Noah's wife Emzara, uh, which is based on the Book of Jubilees. It calls her that. That's a book from about the 2nd century B.C. It's not inspired scripture. It doesn't belong in the Bible, but it was a popular book, and it's a name that, that um, Jewish writers had given to Noah's wife. It really just means like uh, ancestor of Sarah, so it was a way to connect um, Noah to Abraham and Noah's wife to Abraham's wife. And then we see Shem and his wife. We see Ham and his wife and Japheth and his wife. And then we talked about why they're designed the way they are, why they look the way they do. The sons should look very similar because they're, they're brothers. But the diversity that we see should be seen more through the, the wives on the ark, especially the sons' wives. And someone just asked us how long to spend at the ark. We did answer that before. But um, again, it's just like three hours, if you, a few hours, if you go through and just want to walk through and maybe just look at the exhibits, not spend too much time with them, you know, maybe pass them by. But really a full day if you want to see everything, read everything. And, uh, and then again, you have other things that you want to do too with the Ararat Red Zoo. And then obviously um, maybe need to eat and, and Mazar's Kitchen. So um, yeah. And the zip lines, which uh, are not open yet, just so you know, but they are coming. And then the camel rides will be coming very soon. So, and the donkey rides. So be watching for that. Um, we'll notify you when those are open. Right. The zip line course and the, the challenge course that are out there are... <laughs> we have a spectacular course already at the Creation Museum. But the first tower that's here... If you've been to the Creation Museum, zip lines, that first tower is about 30 to 40 feet high. The first one out here is about 80 feet high. That would be amazing when it opens, I'll tell you what. <laughs> and then it goes over a valley that's like 100 feet deep, so you're going to be almost 200 feet off the ground on that first zip line. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing that one. <laughs> that might be a little too edgy for me. But We do have a lot of interest in the zip line, so I'm really looking forward to doing them. I am too. They're, I, they're going to be spectacular, and they should be opening very soon. So here we see Shem's, Shem is in his room. Uh, his, his wife's not in here at this point. So one of the things that we did is, you know, we've got signage that talks about who these people were, what they were like, and the way to come up with their characters or their characteristics and their personalities, what we did is we, we know certain things about Noah that we've talked about before and who was Noah, that he had skill in woodworking. We know he was a righteous man. Um, we know that he was able to lead people. He was able to uh, design things like, like the ark. So what we did is we took those characteristics or their skills and divided them up among the sons. And so Shem is um, like Noah in the sense of Noah being a righteous man. Shem is the one in, who is in the line to Jesus Christ. He's, some of his descendants include Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David. Uh, so we made him, uh, we gave him that part of Noah's characteristic. And then uh, Ham is the one who's more uh, ingenious with his, his ability to build things. Uh, so a lot of the systems we have Ham designing that in Japheth. Uh, we have, uh, he's more like the green thumb. He's the one that's able to plant things and grow the crops and provide the food that they needed. And then we based the, the wives' personality to complement their husbands. And on the, behind us we see uh, Japheth and his wife. And we already saw his wife before where she was by the door of the ark and she was um, struggling with that issue because the door uh, reminded her that, you know, a lot of times we think about the door, we think about this, the safety, the salvation from the flood that it provided for Noah and his family, but at the same time it symbolized judgment for those who were outside. Um, so we can, we can rest in that sense that, that God protects us when we're in Jesus Christ, but for those who are out, it, they should not be settled, they should not, their soul shouldn't be comforted, they should be uh, considering their own mortality and, and thinking about what their eternity holds. So here we see Japheth and his wife. And then I mentioned early on that uh, about the vegetables, how could they 
grow certain things. Well, we've got a garden here on the top, but we don't have a lot of fresh fruit or anything because I don't know that that would keep really well. But some of the the uh, vegetables could keep. And then we've got a kitchen area back behind us, and it's fully stocked at this point. So, Jeremy, if you want to make something for lunch. <laughs> And then we also have our, and people can walk through here, so we can do that. And there's signage explaining things. Actually, this the stove is pretty cool. It's it, um, designed after a um, a stove that one of our designers, uh, Kristen Anderson, she laid out this whole area. She saw a stove that actually looked like that actually looked like that in um, Western Africa, uh, Northwestern Africa, I think, when they were in Morocco, and. When she designed these, they built them and they actually used them to cook some soup to make sure it would work. So, and it did. So it's a real working exhibit. It's not just a prop in, in the sense that, you know, for visual purposes. Right. We wanted to make sure that it was something that was functional, that, that uh, it's not a design just because it looked cool. It's a design because it would actually work. And here we have him and, him and his wife uh, helping prepare the meal for that evening. And we show a loom in the living quarters as well. So they could use it to make uh, tapestries or rugs or clothing. And then to the right we have the aviary. And I think people will, a lot of people will recognize the scene that's here now. And this is at the near the end of the flood. Uh, actually the ark had already landed and Noah had sent out the raven. And then he sent out a dove. And then he sent out a dove again. And this time we see the dove returning and it's got something in its beak. And that's the olive leaf. So uh, Noah knew that the plants were regrowing at that point. And not long after that, God would tell them to, that they could leave the ark. And then we have, in the aviary, we see several uh, birds throughout. And then we have Noah and his wife. Their room is over here. But, of course, they're not in it because we just saw them over bringing in the dove. But each of these rooms has uh, several features that uh, showcase the personality of that, the people that that lived in there. Uh, so you can see some of the things that Noah was interested in or the things that his wife was interested in. But now that we're on the third floor uh, and we've gone through the living quarters, the rest of the, the ark is designed to take us from the time of the flood. And this first area is called, um, the, it's our, uh, you know, what happened outside the ark, what happened to our world during the flood. And these are some of the more scientific exhibits. We have the, the flood, we have Ice Age, we have uh, Babel, we have Ancient Man that I mentioned, and then we have one on flood legends and one on the covenant that God makes with uh, Noah after the flood. So let's step in here real quick. We won't, we won't go through every single teaching point, but I mentioned earlier that one world, two views idea, and that's what we wanted to showcase throughout here. So we have, you can see that again, uh, that when you're looking at the the world, when we look at the rocks, when we look at fossils, when we look at uh, anything in our world, we interpret that through our worldview. And as Christians, uh, Bible-believing Christians, we believe that God created the world in six days, roughly 6,000 years ago, and then he judged it with a worldwide flood, and that we would see evidence of that in the world today. So we have several uh, signs throughout this exhibit designed to teach people uh, how to to look at that evidence, but then we have this area uh, with some of the spectacular artwork showing people what would have happened to our world during the flood. We believe there was one continent prior to the flood. Uh, Genesis 1 talks about how all the water was gathered together in one place. It seems like all the land was in one place, but now we have seven continents. How did that happen? And this artwork uh, and teaching points showcase that. All right, so that's a very fast tour of the the room talking about uh, flood and the flood and geology, but um, we don't want to spoil it by giving away all the teaching points. But this is the Ice Age exhibit, and there are so many really fascinating things about the Ice Age. As creationists, we believe there was a there was an Ice Age, and it would have been caused by the worldwide flood. In fact, there are. Um, the secular view would say that there have been multiple ice ages over long periods of time, but the, if you look at the models, in order for them to get those to work properly, they have to fudge the temperature numbers by up to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But we, 
we can explain how there would be an ice age as a result of the worldwide flood, and we do that in this room. We also talk about why some of the animals during the ice age grew so large. You know, people think of the, the woolly mammoth, and uh, there were other creatures as well, like Gigantopithecus, this ape that had a 12-foot arm span. Uh, how, why did they get so large in the Ice Age? So we talk about that. And Jeremy, you probably recognize that voice. Oh, yeah, isn't it got some guy called uh, Ham or something like that? So uh, this diorama behind us shows us the Lost Squadron. And uh, what that is, uh, Ken Ham is on the video explaining, but it shows how uh, these planes that landed in Greenland back in 1942 in less than 50 years when they found them again, they were underneath over 250 feet of snow and ice. And during the debate that, that your dad, Ken Ham, had with uh, Bill Nye, yeah. Bill Nye kept saying, well, each of these little layers are annual layers, and there's hundreds of thousands of these annual layers. Well, 250 feet of snow and ice with way more than 50 layers in, it in less than 50 years. So how did that happen? The truth is those are not annual layers. They form whenever there's different storms or whatever it thaws out and refreezes. And now we're moving into the Babel exhibit, and you can see again the One World, Two Views logo that we have throughout. And uh, this, really one of the highlights of this room, uh, you know, people wonder why is Babel an important thing. Well, we talk about the seven seeds of history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, which is the flood, uh, confusion at the Tower of Babel. We can use that not only to explain the origin of languages that we see in the, in the world today, but also the different people groups. And so Babel is an important uh, place for us to talk about that we all go back to uh, one man and one woman, back to Adam and Eve, and then later on to Noah and his wife. Uh, we're all descendants of them. That means from, from a biblical perspective, there's no basis at all for racism. Uh, it's, we're, we're all one race. We're all members of, uh, of one family. So this is the Tower of Babel exhibit, and it really is spectacular. Um, all of these little people that you see in here were 3D printed, all the little animals. There are about 1,000 people and 300 animals in there that were all hand-painted by one guy after they came off the 3D printer. Um, in fact, everything that you see in here other than the grass and the ground itself was 3D printed back in our studio in Hebron. And the mural in the back was not either. That was painted. <laughs> but, it's, Tell you what, they're very detailed. It's, I was amazed every time I got to walk back into that area where the, where the artists were working on things. And, and even the dioramas that we got a glimpse of in the pre-flood world, the, the quality of the work is, is mind-blowing. It's, it's spectacular. And each of these little characters, he, he painted all of them without even using a magnifying glass. And, and he can still see straight, which is amazing. Wow. So then we wanted to use the second room of this exhibit, the second bay, to deal with the people groups that we talked about earlier, that we all go back to Noah and his wife. And we also wanted to look at some of the evidences that we see in our world today that seem to point back to the Tower of Babel. So we see um, large pyramid-like things, large towers, and uh, throughout the world in, in nearly every continent. And oftentimes they have a very similar purpose, some sort of ritual purpose. Um, is it because they, once people spread out from Babel, they brought their ideas and beliefs with them and then eventually started rebuilding? It, that's very possible. Uh, we also have legends from around the world that, that sound very much like the, the Babel event. And oftentimes when people think about the pyramids, they think, oh, did aliens build that? So we wanted to take a little time to deal with some of the cultural issues that we have. Uh, you know, it's very popular on the History Channel right now to have ancient aliens programs. I, I think they're in their ninth or tenth season already. <laughs> And it's just a very popular show, but there's no reason for us uh, when we begin from Scripture to think that aliens were involved or that aliens even exist. Uh, people were incredibly talented and incredibly smart. They could build those sort of structures without alien involvement. Oh, and then yeah. we, also, we also do address another hot-button issue, and that's uh, whether or not, um, you know, is there a basis for racism for prejudice in scripture and we've already talked about how we're all one blood we're all created by god we're all uh, loved by god and we're all one race the human race so there's no basis for racism but that hasn't stopped some people from misusing the bible to justify uh, wrong behavior and wrong attitudes 
we mentioned the ancient man exhibit earlier. Uh, Jeremy, you had asked me about you know the technology that we have today. Does not that show that we're smarter? They were Stone Age people, that kind of thing. Well, the fact of the matter is there are Stone Age people today. There are cave dwellers today. There are hunter-gatherers today. All the different kinds of groups of people that that the popular secular view would say, you know, that we progress from this to this to this. All of those kind of people exist today in different areas of the world. It really depends on what, um, where you live and what kind of um, skills you have. But I mentioned how technology does not equal intelligence. Well, Isaac Newton's a great example of that. You know, here's a guy living in the 17th and 18th century that I think, well, he's widely considered the greatest scientist of all time. Um, he's, I think, much smarter than, than we are. Uh, but he didn't have smartphones, he didn't have computers. And once again, we see the One World, Two Views idea on the back to, to talk about uh, which view is confirmed by history in archaeology, the biblical view or the popular secular model. So in this room, we wanted to talk about um, you know, how could Noah have acquired the skills to build the ark. You know, before we built this, a lot of people asked the question, well, how could Noah fit the animals on the ark? And now they see how large the ark is. And one of the questions that we get a lot is, how could he build something so big and sophisticated? Because he was smart. And so we deal with that question in this area. And as we move into the next area of the ancient man exhibit, we wanted to deal with... We wanted to show people that man from the beginning has been intelligent. Even shortly after the flood, we see things like the Great Pyramid being built. And we, we look at that today and say, how in the world did they do that? And yet this is just a few centuries after the flood. Men were capable of doing that. And Noah was building the ark at the time of his cultures. Most likely they were at the peak of their te technological capabilities before the flood. And then shortly after you see men building the Tower of Babel. And then, then they're scattered again. And then shortly after that you have the Great Pyramid being built. You have Stonehenge being built. And there are a lot of false views about ancient man in our culture. Uh, so we wanted to deal with that. We have um, on this wall, even we talked about the word prehistoric earlier, Jeremy. We have a, a paragraph talking about how that's, that word doesn't make sense from a biblical worldview. God created everything in six days. Man was here on day six, and God told us what he did before that. So there is no prehistory. Man has been around to record that from really from the beginning. Yeah. So even using that term really doesn't make sense in a biblical worldview. So we do have an uh, exhibit from the Museum of the Bible that we're going to skip over, but uh, we really encourage you to go through that exhibit. It's very spectacular, very well done. The Museum of, of the Bible people installed here. Uh, is there anything else that people can look forward to when they come in yeah, the let's, coming months? Yeah, let's take a look at one more exhibit, and then I'll, I'll show you what's going to be coming in, in a few months. This is a the Flood Legends, video, or Flood Legends area. Um, there are more than 200 Flood Legends from around the world that... Many of them seem very similar to the Genesis account. There's some distortions, there's some changes along the way, but um, but oftentimes they'll talk about eight people. They'll talk about the, you know God or the gods were angry and told one man to build this boat, bring the animals. There's a rainbow after the flood. Those kind of things we find from around the globe, and it's not because Christian missionaries went around the world telling people about that, because these cultures don't know anything about the gospel message, which is why missionaries go there in the first place. So this exhibit shows where a lot of those legends are found. It deals with some of the skeptical objections to it. And it has a fun video that people can watch that shows what would happen to some of those other boats or arcs in those flood legends because oftentimes it's just a little canoe or it's just a, you know, like the Epic of Gilgamesh has a big cube. And, and people can watch in a fun, lighthearted way what would happen if you actually put one of those arcs in the, in the flood. And <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. <laughs> That's one of the things that we see from a biblical perspective that shows that this was a historical event. The ark described in scripture has the perfect dimensions for sea keeping and for safety, security, for strength and, and stability. All of those dimensions are, are perfect for that. Whereas the other ones that we see in the flood legends are would not work. But um, yeah, this is the Museum of the Bible exhibit that we're gonna skip over, but it really is quite spectacular. It shows how the Bible spread around the world how it, was, how it was translated and uh, copied and then spread throughout the world. And one of the exhibits we're going to be installing in the near future is, I think, going to be, it'll probably be my favorite one when it's all said and done. Uh, we have a responsibility here to share the truth of Scripture, to share the gospel message. And this end of the, the third floor, the bow end of the ark, this whole area is going to be one large exhibit called Why the Bible's True. 
and it's going to end with a very uh, unique and very powerful gospel presentation. But we're going to follow three college students around uh, their campus. Uh, one of them is a believer, and he's witnessing to two of his friends, and they're questioning him uh, about his beliefs, why he believes that Scripture is true. He's able to answer some of their questions, point them uh, to a place where they can find answers for themselves. So we see a young lady really searching for those answers. And then ultimately there's a something that happens that brings everything to a head, and... Um, they challenge the guy who's witnessing to him again and he says well let me explain why this is so important that we can deal with questions and answers all day long but ultimately I have to explain to you why this is so important and he's going to walk them through a gospel presentation that will be very unique that will begin with Noah and the flood and the door of the ark and walk them through biblical history explaining the most important message we could ever share and so I'm very excited about that right now we do have a gospel presentation that I think is also unique we call this uh, like the the views of the cross and so we see this crucifixion scene this artwork is actually from that other exhibit and we're looking at the reactions that certain people had to Jesus on the cross you have the the mocking thief you have the centurion who says truly this man was the son of God uh, you have the repentant thief and um, which if you were there which one of those people describes you are you one of the ones who mocked are you one of the ones who uh, maybe you're at the foot of the cross gambling for his clothes because you're so distracted by worldly concerns that you, you miss the fact that you're part of the most important event that's ever happened. So we wanted people to, to look at where they would fit in this scene and if they're not like the repentant thief, that they would consider uh, what Christ has done for them on the cross and uh, by rising from the dead three days later and to realize the importance of trusting in him for salvation. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate you showing us through and just giving us a little insight into the behind the exhibits and the content and the reasoning. And we encourage you to come. You can plan your visit at arkencounter.com. We are open for the first 40 days from, starting from July 7th from 9 a.m. to midnight. So those are the extended hours just to allow people to come through. And you can even come at night and you can even get pictures in front of the ark at sunset or even at nighttime. It's really cool pictures that you can get you know in addition to getting the ones during the day so you can come when you please and during the day or in the evening and just find out all the information from arkengowner.com and then you can even uh, contact us from there if, if you have more questions that we don't have at the website so thank you very much we have one other one other thing too um, we mentioned the the air at ridge we mentioned the zip lines that are coming we mentioned the restaurant we didn't mention the gift shop down the oh, underneath yes. the ark yes. um, so Directly below us, all the way at the very bottom, is this really a spectacular gift shop. It's called the Souk, which is like a Middle Eastern market kind of place. Um, but all sorts of gifts, a lot of fair trade gifts, which are uh, you know designed by uh, or are made by people who are living in poverty. It's a way to help uh, help uh, lift these people out of poverty by purchasing those gifts. So we have a lot of those items down in the gift shop, and uh, you. I don't think you'll regret spending time down there. I noticed there are a lot of unique items when you're just going through. A, a lot of um, very interesting things that you can see that I haven't really seen much elsewhere. So it's really cool down there. Right. It's not just like your traditional bookstore like the, you know, the Creation Museum has. a. It's more like a resource a bookstore, which is, I love as a content person. That's what I like. But down here, there's some incredible gifts that are made by people that, um, uh, you know, they do it for the Lord. But at the same time, they're also helping their families uh, that are greatly in need. Sir. Sure.